Hi, and welcome to Sustainably Smart Talks. I'm your host, AJ Makarapa, and today I'm joined by my guest, Ashraf Hawa Nyoko, a researcher in biofuel recovery. And today we're diving deep into her groundbreaking research on biofuel recovery using hot micro bubbles gas stripping. Well, Ashraf, please introduce yourself, your academic journey, and how you became involved in sustainability and biofuel recovery. Hello, my name is Ashraf, as AJ says. I'm a chemical engineer from the Department of Chemical Engineering from Loughborough University. I did my undergrad and master's in chemical engineering. Also, I did an MEng in Loughborough University, so I've been here for a while. And my research mostly focuses on biofuel recovery and also organic acid recovery from, sust- by, from sustainable means of production. So by sustainable means of production, we mean by looking at waste products or agriculture, also known as agricultural byproducts, or also um, for gas fermentation systems, we're also looking at industrial off gases. So this means leftover carbon dioxide and hydrogen that we're looking at converting them into biofuels for sustainability for our sustainability purposes okay so what's the dr- your driving force behind your research into biofuel recovery i think one of my main driving force is just looking for more sustainable ways of cleaner energy and cleaner sustainable fuels for example we're just talking about it from the international energy agency where they're estimating we need around 400 billion liters of biofuel by 2030, by 2050, by 2030 actually, for us to achieve our net zero target. Currently, at the rate that we're producing, we, we're going to be around 40% short of that by that target. So that means that there's a large gap of biofuels that we need to produce. And then also the other aspect of looking at it is when I look at other countries such as Brazil, where they produce biofuels, they tend to produce it from crop foods. And when you produce things from crop, crop, crop foods, by crop foods, we mean things like maize, corn, etc., anything that ha- is sugar-rich and has high um, carbohydrate content. But when we look at it, one of the UN goals, SDG goals, is actually food security. Yes, indeed. So for you to achieve food security, you cannot use your food sources to produce fuel sources. Well, you can, but it's just not sustainable at the end of the goal. Like, I don't see the full sustainability aspect of it. Especially when we have food insecurities in certain countries that we've, we've clearly observed. So my research focuses on alternatives. The research before me focused on agricultural biofuels, which uh, agricultural byproducts, which is lignocellulose biomass. Mm-hmm. So when you look at a crop, you know the edible part is known as a crop food, but then the leaf, the tusk, the stems are inedible parts. Those are the parts that people normally don't eat. They just end up in the dustbins. They end up as waste. But however, we can also convert those ones into agricultural byproducts. Yes, indeed. Or the other alternative, which is gas fermentation, where you use hydrogen and carbon dioxide that has been captured into from the air, and then you convert them into into energy into energy sources such as ethanol and biofuels. Also, that's that, that's another alternative. Yes, indeed. So, what is the science behind using hot micro bubbles then? So the science between using hot microbubbles, if anyone is familiar with in-situ gas recovery, which is just a product, a recovery type of ethanol or biofuels from fermentation systems, is basically, think of this, you have an oven, you have your cake baking in the oven. If you don't remove your cake over time, what happens to your cake? It burns off, right? So think of your oven as the ethanol and then think of the cake as the microbes that are inside. Because we need microbes. Microbes are things like yeast. They're able to consume the carbohydrates or the CO2 or hydrogen to produce biofuels. But whenever there's too much ethanol, it leads to toxicity, also known as inhibition, in which they start dying off. Yes, that's indeed. And what we tend to have is we have premature death of these microbes. These microbes can be expensive and then they die very early when the concentration gets about 5% or even higher, which leaves you with very diluted produce which can decrease your economic viability of your process. So what we aim to do is we aim to continuously extract the biofuels or the ethanol from the fermentation broth as it's being produced to let the microbes breathe in a way, basically just making it like a cleaner, healthier way for them, for them to achieve full expression of cells, for them to fully express ethanol throughout. How microbubble comes in is we have heated gas, heated tiny gas that goes into the broth Yes, indeed. It attracts the ethanol due to mass transfer effects as smaller bubbles have better mass transfer effects. 
slower rise in velocity. It's, it's, so it's able to capture the ethanol more productively and then we continuously remove the ethanol. So that means we end up with a more concentrated ethanol at the end of the system as it's continuously being produced. And we're also able to get the cells to fully produce to their ma almost their maximum, not them dying off early. Okay, excellent. So what makes this method uh, different from traditional biofuel extraction techniques? So the traditional um, extraction techniques that we have, the most similar one to it is gas stripping technology, which is mostly just purging large amounts of gas into the system. Larger bubbles lead to smaller mass transfer effects. Larger bubbles, larger gases are more expensive. They can be more expensive, more energy intensive. Our system, we use microfluidic oxalators to create tiny bubbles yes, indeed. that require smaller flu lower flow rates compared to what you would need from gas stripping systems. Yes, indeed. So what were some of the challenges you faced while working with uh, hot microbubbles? Well, with hot microbubbles, the other thing you have to keep in mind of, even though most studies have shown that hot microbubbles do not have heating onto the liquid. So that means the hot bubbles do not actually heat the liquid. They're just meant to evaporate the ethanol into the bubbles itself. However, what we realized from our system is that that is not the case. There's actually heat transfer into the liquid. And you would want to prevent that to prevent the cells from dying. Because if you have, if you heat your liquid above a certain temperature, you're, incre you're, in you're increasing the amount of cooling effects that you need. And as you know, the more cooling you need, the more electricity cost you have, the more economic cost you have, and that will make it less viable. And that's not what we want. Because if you're going through sustainability, you want it to be balanced out with, with energy, with energy um, targets. So I think that has been the biggest challenge. It's just little things along the process that you have to take into account Listen, for the sustainability aspect. Also, the amount of equipment you need, the materials built for those equipment, the life cycle that you also need to take into consideration. So not just the feasibility of the technology, but the economic and sustainable viability of the project is also highly important. Yes, indeed. You, you mentioned a little bit about it, but can we go deeper into this? And one key aspect of sustainability is reducing environmental impact, right? So how does your method contribute to a cleaner, more sustainable biofuel industry? Well, hopefully my research is going to help by producing ethanol at a larger scale when this technology is fully implemented at large scale, and then this would make it a more ethanol production, uh, increase the ethanol productivity or any product that we actually end up producing. Because right now we're looking at ethanol, but ethanol is not just the, it's just one aspect. We also look at how we can also improve other bioproducts and also bioorganic products, bioorganic derivatives, right? So what it helps is that it could also improve the productivity. So we have larger titers. As I told you, we currently have an almost 50% gap from where we are and where we need to be. Yes, indeed. So that gap can be achieved when you have a larger amount of people actually producing it, right? And then the second one is also the economic viability. One of the main things that we tend to forget, especially as engineers or researchers, is we don't think of the financial aspects of this, these things and how they actually affect the processes. If something is too expensive, or it, it will be the hardest part of, like people always follow the path of least resistance. Yes, indeed they do. So if petroleum is the cheapest, they're going to automatically go towards petroleum products. So you have to find a way to make biofuels more attractive by having a lot of it more to decrease the market price and then also the technologies around it being more affordable yes, for indeed. everyone to be able to, in, in, to, be able to um, incorporate into their processes. Yes, indeed. Well, have any governments or industries ap approached your research? Well, we have been working, prior to even me joining this research, this research has already had traction from our group, from industrial partners. Okay. Most of our um, cells, our broths, even our equipment that we use from our fluidic oxalators are all from industrial partners actually looking into this research. We had enough funding into this research. Even my research is actually funded for this particular purpose. Obviously, we cannot fully di disclose most of the results that we've had from this and what's going on. But there's been a large amount of interest from industry. Yes, indeed. So what would need to happen to make this technology more wildly adopted? I would say more of a policy change. Maybe people looking at policies. Because most of the time, what I've noticed nowadays is that people are looking for a large impact. Not a large impact, yes. but something that makes a mass, something that sounds good. That's it. You want to think nuclear. You want to have hydrogen. But they don't think of the already existing ones that we could just optimize, such as biofuels, because biofuels has always existed. We've had countries that have been able to apply biofuels into their systems normally, like Brazil, that we've always spoken about, that have engines that run up to 30%. 
biofuel systems. But then, so that's what needs to change. Policy and also a mindset change. Let's think of how to use biofuels. For my home country, we've been focusing a lot on CNG, okay. which is compressed natural gas. Okay. When we could, and it has, there's been so much resistance around it, when we could just look at biofuel for some weird reason. But then, yeah, that's why, I mean, we tend to look at the more niche aspect and then developing our already existing technologies. Okay. Uh, beyond your research, are there any personal sustainability practices you follow that you recommend to our audience? Well, as the Officer for Sustainability for the PhD SSN, there's so many sustainable practices I recommend because sustainability is not just about what you do or your research. It's a way of life and I'll forever always live with that motto. You have to think of everything you do from your recycling to how whenever you go shopping, you, you, you need to use more reusable bags. Even when you're getting water or you're getting coffee, think of using reusable cups. Like Think of all of those little, little things as a whole brand of things that like whenever you want to use paper plates, just think of, I could use my ceramic plates instead. Those sorts of little, especially as students, Good. tend to be a little bit more careless when it comes to these sort of things because we're just thinking of the now, now, now. But for a future that we want and for the cleaner future that we want for us to achieve our net zero targets, we all need to come together and take make these little, little changes in life. Smart. I agree with that. So... You're saying the sustainability, not just what you do, your study, it's also your personality in your everyday life. It should be, it should be, it should be definitely. So how can individuals contribute to a more sustainable energy future? Individuals can do that. Like Even on campus, I've seen lots of changes from the canned water that we have to recycle reusable uh, bottles made of sugar cane that I've seen on campus, which are really cool. I think those are the things that we should look towards more using in our daily lives. Okay. Even when you plan on using reusable bags, non non reusable bags, think of using compostable ones. So those little little practices. When even when it comes to your clothing, we love shopping. Everyone loves shopping, but this just think of the sustainability of that clothes. Do I really need it? How long would it last compared to how would it disintegrate? What material is it made of? What chemicals have been added? So just little little things that should just be taken into consideration. I think definitely. Well, you were a finalist in the Game Changer Awards. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah, it was a really good award that the Supergen Bioenergy Hub had, in which you present your research, then they pick out of your research, they pick um the finalists that they want for the Biohub, and then you get to go to the Energy Awards that was hosted in Transcorp in London, I think, last year. And that during that event, you get to meet so many industrial partners, major game changers in the oil field, just in general, and then they get to vote on who would win the award. And then it's just for you to basically network and have a foot into that particular industry. It was a very good award, to be fair. A very good event to attend and to actually have an interaction. Because the people that go there are not just fuel focused or energy focused, but also people that are into architecture, into highways, and they're just thinking of how to make energy more sustainable in a way. That's for sure. Well, well, you're well revered by uh, your peers and your ac and uh, fellow academics. So, uh, what advice would you give to young researchers or innovators interested in sustainability? For young research, even in general, not just into sustainability, just make sure your research. Just think of how to make your research more sustainable. That's the one thing I think we owe the planet, or we owe the world, is for us to be more sustainable. Whenever you're thinking of a research and you have your technique, think about the life cycle assessment of it. Think of the environmental impacts of it. Think of the economic cost of it. Because sometimes we always just want something to work, but we don't think of the financial aspect of it. Like, yes, it works in theory, but what's the use of producing a product that is more expensive than the one that is already existing? Like, would people actually want to in use yours? Like, we have to think of making our sustainable targets um, a reality, a smoother reality. Well, yeah, that's true. Well, what's next for you? Are there any exciting developments or new projects on the horizon that well, you can share with us? That's the main project right now. Is I'm still trying to get the ground in into that. I'm still a relatively new researcher. Funny enough, I'm just I just entered my second year, so we're still trying to fully optimize our technology, make sure it's working, hit the ground running, and then also try it across other product groups. So not just ethanol, even though I've mentioned ethanol quite a few. But my research looks at a larger range of bioproducts. Okay. And that's it. And then also, my social life is just me trying to think of 
new sustainable events to have, new sustainable things to host for people to come in and just basically guide them into the targets that we have. That's indeed. You mentioned ethanol. So what areas of biofuel recovery you think still need a lot of attention or, in, or innovation? Um, so for now, I've, for now, one of the major ones has been gas fermentation systems in which you use industrial gases to produce mm. ethanol or biofuel. That's the other aspect that I think could use a lot of more attention when it comes to the upstream aspect of it, maybe the micro production. Excellent. Micro, um, engineering, yeah. Excellent. Well, for, as we wrap up, for, for companies in the biofuel industry, how can they adopt more sustainable practices, particularly in biofuel recovery? For most industries in biofuel, I find that they're a lot more um, sustainable. It's just they, maybe the technologies that they use for them to look at the energy demand of those technologies, maybe that's the most thing that they should have a look at. Okay, excellent. For listeners interested in learning more or following your work, uh, where can they find you online? Um, they can always find me on my LinkedIn. Yes, yeah, which will be attached on this thing. Sunday. Well, any papers, uh, websites, or up- upcoming talks you would recommend? I recently just did um, Pints of Science, which was a really good one. And I've also been to some conferences. So hopefully if you have me on my LinkedIn, you'll be able to see me on my conferences and you'll be able to have a quick talk. And then for the papers, we have some papers that are under review that hopefully when they're published, we'll add them to the link under the under the video yes indeed well we did touch a little bit about the crops is and that that's the the crops the pasta being stripped off right could you explain that a little bit in more accessible terms for me sorry would, could you explain that more could you uh explain that one uh you talked a little bit about the tr- about the crops right yes and uh i would like you to explain to me about this in more accessible terms if that's okay okay so when you think of crop foods or things uh crop foods are food that we eat so yeah, like sugar cane, corn, maize, and the things, well, corn and maize are the same thing, but sugar corn and cassava, anything that is high sugar, high carbohydrates, those are what are mostly known as crop foods. And those ones are the ones that are typically used for biofuel production. But if you think of this, if everyone decides to move to biofuel production, we need about 400 billion liters. I keep reiterating this. So imagine how much amount of food we need to produce 400 liters of that. Listen. If you take that much amount of food, how much will be left for the people to eat? Listen. Most of you, most of the, a larger majority of the countries that produce this, these foods, that's their main source of carbohydrates that's what they normally eat on a daily basis Indeed. maize flour um sugar, sugar cane is used for a large amount of processes as a syrup as a sweetener as a fructose sweetener right yes indeed so if you remove them and use them for food for biofuel rather than food you're just adding to the food insecurity that we currently have or the lack of food okay that's the main. That's the main target. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid that food versus spoil argument and just focusing on all the alternative ways. Because there are alternative ways, like I said, lignocellulose like biomass. Okay. Which I'll simplify. Like I said, is the inedible part of the crop, the leaves, the stem, all the greeny bits. Just think of when you're having corn. You don't. You never eat the cob, right? So the cob and all the waste part. Or you could also use industrial off gases, like I've mentioned, where we have them, we've captured them all around. Okay. As we wrap up, what are the three main points you want your audience to take away from your research and its potential impact? Well, sustainability one, sustainability is a way of life. Biofuel production doesn't have to be from crop food, it can be from a range of other things. And then the future, the clean energy future has a lot of possibilities. You can do carbon phase outs also. So it's not just about carbon capture, carbon storage, but it's also slow phase outs of it and using other sustainable means such as biofuels. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, I'm happy with that. Well, well welcome. This was another episode of Sustainably Smart Talks. I'm your host, AJ McHarper. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.